do, do we have a question for the panel? Uh, I have a question for Mark on the left. How worried are you about the perception of a loss of privacy uh, for with telematics? Um, well, I, well, I'm not concerned. Well, I'm not concerned. I think it's um, it's a it's, it's a concept that, that's put about by people who, who don't really understand what's going on in in the market. If I'm saving a customer on average, as I am, six hundred and fifty pounds uh, on his motor insurance, um, the idea of me uh, under, having a or him having a problem or her having a problem with data really just disappears. On average. Our customers are using their cars for about 5% of the day. Okay, They get in the car in the morning, they go to work or college or wherever it is, they get in the car in the evening and they go home. It's not really that interesting. Um, there's far more information that's available on a mobile phone. And in fact, I was listening the other day to somebody who was telling me that the amount of information that's available from supermarkets they can analyse what you're buying and determine whether or not your relationship is breaking down. So it's, it's not a problem. I mean, if you give someone an, an, a, a, enough uh, incentive to, to purchase a product, they'll purchase it, irrespective of the data. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> is, is, has anybody doing an a, um, insurance where you just pay as you go? Does that happen yet? You just pay for what you use, i.e., so I only pay for the five minutes. No. The five percent? No. No, no. It's very difficult to do that. You really do at this, this stage. You do need a 12-month policy uh, in order to uh, in order to price. And, and, and I'm not quite sure of my position here, but I think you probably would legally need a 12-month policy. But oh, 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 I see. Uh, but but I have to be careful on that one. I have to get the the regular. Oh, there's a man there. who might know the answer. He's an actuary. Oh, okay. Let's ask an actuary. <laughs> I, I'm not an actuary, so you're you're probably much more expert on this. Hi, Dhruv Harya. Um, I think Aviva run a. a, a project about two, three years ago where they tried pay-as-you-go, but for some reason it didn't work out. I just didn't get market uptake. Yeah, yeah um, they, sorry, they did have, a, Aviva did have a, a, a pay-as-you-go policy per se, rather than driving behavior policy, but it was a 12-month policy. Ah, uh, okay, thanks for the clarification. Okay. okay, you could have an amount, you could have a figure, right, where essentially, where essentially, you know, obviously, depending on how much you use it, you're obviously going to get a different bill, well, feasibly. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, the way our product works, just to clarify, if I may, um, we uh, initially our product was a 6,000 mile product. So we had to, in order to, to get to market, we had to have a proposition that worked with the price comparison sites because that was our, our distribution. Um, so we had to put a product that said, comparatively, this is the price. And we would ask a consumer how many miles they thought they were going to drive every year. And if you ask most people on a price comparison site, they'll say 6,000 miles because they think it's going to be cheaper. They're probably not telling the entire truth, but nevertheless, that's what they say. So we priced our product 6,000 miles. If someone used more than 6,000 miles a year, we allowed them to top up like a mobile phone. So that was, that was our concept. Is it feasible? Uh, I'm sure it will be, but is, is it feasible at the moment where depending on your driving style in terms of how hard you brake, how fast you accelerate, etc., you could have something very tangible but where the box would actually be showing you the amount. So you could say, this trip has cost me £3.50. Yeah, we, we don't drill down to that level at the moment because you would be then suggesting that you're feeding back to the customer in real time while they're in the car, and that would cause us a problem because there's some sort of suggestion that you're not concentrating on what, how you're driving. Now, could you do it at the end of every trip? Possibly. We haven't got to that level of sophistication yet, but we do uh, feed back to customers at the moment. We have a product called Drive Like a Girl, which we introduced as a result of the gender directive. Um, have you not, you not heard the adverts? Okay. Um, on the radio. Uh, so the, the, the concept there is that we say um, to the consumer, we know that people who drive like a average female are safer, especially under 25. So if you drive like a girl in the first three months of the policy, we will rebate some of the premium to you. Yeah, they're... Um the uh, pay-as-you-go option and and also that, that real-time is, is stuff that's starting to bubble through from Silicon Valley. Um, there's an app at the moment, and the name escapes me, but um, it's getting quite a bit of buzz over there. And it's purely in the discovery phase at the moment, and that is it's telling you how good you drive after every, after every trip. 
and um, and so it gives you know both qualitative and quantitative feedback. Um, they're pitching it as as somewhat um, you know similar kind of tapping into that vitality market, uh, similar to kind of a feedback loop that um, that idea of capturing all your data and, and feeding it back to you. Um, so so that's definitely happening. I know those guys are thinking you know the the end game there is to kind of sell insurance, obviously. Um, and then the the pay as you go, there are a number of people that are doing day to day policies and trying to do day to day policies. Um, some are succeeding, some are failing. There was there was one group that was doing them last year. I don't know if they're still around. Um, it's obviously has a really big selection problem. I have a question for you, Mark. Actually, um, based on what Kim said there, he said it was an app that they're developing. I assume that yours isn't smartphone related. Yours is actually a box that you put in the car. Can you see the box being replaced by smartphones? This is my favourite subject. Um, absolutely not in the foreseeable future. I'm sorry to disagree, my co-panellists, but we've got to understand that technology is wonderful, but you've got to apply it to a business requirement. And in motor insurance in the UK, 85% of the premiums are spent on claims. Now, in order to use this technology properly, we need to mitigate claims costs. And the only way you can really do this is if you have something that provides you with reasonably accurate data and it ain't going to happen with an app it's got to be something that's bolted onto that car and gives you really reliable data about crashes and the way that that vehicle is behaving and unfortunately and I, let me tell you we recently downloaded an app from one of the leading UK motor insurers in the UK and we have never used that app in a motor vehicle we've used it on a train and a plane and we've walked down the street with it and we've actually managed to secure maximum uh, points on that application and it's never been used in a car. I think downstream, if you can harness the technology and you can get the reliable information and you, to use against mitigating claims, I'd be absolutely delighted because it'd be a lot cheaper. But at the moment, it ain't going to happen. Um, Follow-up question. Uh, if not apps... Do the vehicle manufacturers own this market? There seems to be a railway sort of problem here, um, knowing that Mercedes and BMW now have VC funds um, and Ford is, is working really hard on this. It seems like everyone wants to own that data. My second favourite subject um, is uh, <laughs> connected car. I absolutely agree that um, it, in order to expand the market of telematics motor insurance, you need to reduce the cost of technology. Now, if the motor manufacturers are prepared to put the technology in the motor vehicles at point of manufacture, we can harness that technology, clearly that's going to work. And we're talking to a number of motor manufacturers at the moment who have been actually surprising to me, really, um, working with this since 1996. And one of them we're talking to has six million customers in the States already using this technology and uh, with insurers and this horrible expression they use, infotainment. So without a doubt, my view is connected car is the way forward, whereby a whole bunch of different uh, businesses are harnessing the technology that's put in by the motor manufacturers at point of manufacture. Sorry. Um, are you going to expand this into sort of adjacent markets? So could you apply it to a house, for instance? <laughs> I'll avoid saying this is my third favourite subject. Um, yes, it, uh, clearly there are products available at the moment um, which are quite interesting, whereby you can have a product at a reasonably a reasonably priced product that, that you could put into your home yourself, self-installed, um, which would deal with things such as intrusion, fire, flood, etc. Um, there are discussions at the moment about how you could market this product and work with a, a household insurer. But I, I, the whole idea of the internet of things and connectivity, I, I, I can't remember the actual year. There was a report recently said, I think it's by the year 2020 or something like that, there will be seven connected devices for every human being on the planet. So that's your fridge, your house, your car and everything. It's all just going to be wired up. And the information is going to be flying around all over the place. And my, my view is, for what that's worth, is that we really do need to be looking at all of this as an industry to see how we can tap into it um, 
for the benefit of the consumer. We were talking earlier on, so I'm going to get my, my soapbox now, but we were talking earlier on about um, what uh, the consumer thinks of the insurance industry. I'm talking about the, ins the consumer now. And I actually passionately believe that what we've done at Insure the Box is turn around and say, do as you would be done by it. What does a consumer actually want? Start with a blank sheet of paper and let's provide the, insure the, the customer with something they want. Let's use the technology. Let's make get some clarity in place here and be transparent. And if you tell the truth often enough, eventually you get found out. Okay. Should we take another question? Richard Apu. Um, future technological developments, basically what Mark's been saying as far as how this goes for te you know, telematics for car insurance, as you say, you want it to be telematics for health and life insurance. How do you see that technologically developing over the next five to ten years in a way which you know, it, the manufacturers put it into the cars themselves and so on and so forth. How do you see it going? Um, that's a good one. Um, I guess it's around um, having a conversation actually just before. It's around the, the technology we're using and becoming more accurate. So some of the challenges they're facing in car insurance is, is getting uh, the technology right within a phone has been is, is a challenge and will be solved. And I guess uh, there are challenges with what we use around Fitbugs and, and Polar. They're, they're not perfect ways of tracking health. So that will improve. I think there's other bits of technology around our health, whether it be um, other patterns of, of living which we can use and, and inform um, our pricing because it will tell us a bit around the likelihood of, of getting other kind of illnesses. So I think technology will become a bigger part of it uh, and will be more useful going forward. But I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. Yeah. Okay, we have Hi, Julian Smith. Um, I'd just like to ask that the, the panel, we've, we've heard about the difficulties of disrupting an industry which has got lots of regulatory layers over it. But I think we also heard that there's a good chunk of the value chain it, which is in and around the distribution side where there's value to be gone for. Um, I'm not sure how many more opera singers or meerkat price comparison sites we need, but where do, you, where do the panelists see the opportunities for entrepreneurs in this particular part of the value chain? I guess this is a, uh, a good one to pick up. Um, uh, look, I, I would disagree with some of my uh, co-panelists that... Um, a, the disruption is in the distribution, um, and B, that um, it's it's kind of difficult to penetrate. Um, I think both are a perception issue, um, and there's a couple of perceptions there. Um, you have to be quite naive to to want to disrupt this industry because it's going to be hard, and the probability is going to be really low. Um, and there's not that many people floating around that A, are interested in insurance and B, are that naive, but C, have the, I guess, the, um, the abilities to, to actually execute. That being said, it's a perception problem. It's not as hard as we're making out up here. Regulation is there for the consumer. If you think about it, you can get through. It's not that hard. You can disrupt... Um, the manufacturer of insurance. You can disrupt the way it's being done. And one of the things that really kind of gets my goat a little bit is we use this word disrupt. And I'm just trying to think what we're disrupting here. It's it's a little bit of a love fest for all the incumbents at the moment that are just rolling out, you know, features. And that's super. You know, they should be doing that. That's absolutely their job. That's not disrupting. That is adding features. But it's an evolution. There are people coming, you know, the banks are being disaggregated at the moment, foreign exchange payments are going, peer-to-peer -peer lending's going, it's all happening, but it's finance, it's slow. You know, you, you've got to hit the really early adopters who are really fervent about this, and there's a really, really big group, somewhat curated, as was mentioned before, by peer-to-peer. -peer. But, you know, crossing the chasm is hard and slow. But I think one thing that's really in our favour, and you sort of see this across Silicon Valley and also the startup world, is that the early adopters have united across the world. There's, there's no logic anymore in starting a business in the UK and thinking about the UK for the next 10 years and penetrating into that market. It's, it's just an absolute dream. But if you think about going and grabbing all the early adopters, Germany, France, Spain, they, they, they read the same blogs, 
they follow the same startups, they have the same ideas and they talk about it every day. That, that community now cuts across those borders and that really gives us an access to a huge pool of customers that get it. How long is it going to be before it penetrates the mass audience? And I think that's, that's the, the key difference and the key question here is, you know, a lot of the stuff that I talk about, you know, we're talking in the future and got to start it today with a group of believers, but it will come up and bubble up through the consciousness in the future. Whereas telematics today, that's, that's a tool for today. You know, people get it and they get discounts today. It's an innovation on the insurance product today. But, you know, things take time. So I think, I think it'll happen and I think it'll, it'll grow from where it is. But, you know, we do have to penetrate those perception problems. Um, I, I, I sort of agree with Kim. I think you've got to have very deep pockets to do what he's doing. So you've obviously got some great backers. Um, but I think um, on the distribution side, I think there's a genuine opportunity right now. I think, you know, if you've got a, uh, a platform or you can persuade someone who's already got a platform that, say, links all the insurers together, then surely perhaps there's a way for you to come up with a new model that actually challenges the aggregators in the market. So I think there, there are, you've, got to, you've just got to look around at different sort of opportunities. You've got to speak to some of the incumbents, speak to the technology providers. We're one of them. Um, you know, you've got to speak to some of the insurers and say, look, you know, okay, you've got a platform that you've set up. You've got, you know, you've got your own claims department. You've got a, a, way, a process of doing business. Would you ever consider opening that to some entrepreneurs in a slightly different way? So I think you just need to challenge it. I agree that there are incumbents there. I agree that they're quite myopic, but they're, 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 they're that way deliberately because it's very profitable for them. But if you come up with ideas that, that mean that they can make more money out of the industry and you're actually helping them by helping yourselves, I think that's the way that you can really start to change the market in the short term. And that might give you the money to change the market in the long term. I'd, um, I'd agree in sentiment with, uh, with both of those points. I think the thing that makes finance slightly different from other industries is the layers of regulation. And regulation is, not, is both as hard as people make out and also sometimes a lot easier than people make out. And it's this um, uncertainty about where you're going to push and whether it's going to work, which makes it a difficult thing to work with. I think the challenge for the manufacturer of insurance uh, is that effectively give or take a bit, it's kind of covered by a European directive that's taken 13 years to negotiate now and is rolling out like a battleship across Europe. Um, the Americans are sort of doing something similar. The, the framework for the regulation has been adopted basically from, you know, they're, they're using the same framework in Turkey, Mexico, Peru. Um, Australia's got something slightly heavier in place. So there is a there is a, a global agreement between regulators to sort of tighten this up. And what we've seen in the last couple of years is a kickback from the financial crisis is there's been a huge amount of detail put in. In the past, you've had the opportunity to think through some of the rules. But now what we're seeing is a lot of detail. So it's not impossible. Um, it can, anything can be done. We, you know, these rules were put in place and they can be adapted and, and changed in the future. But particularly around anything to do with capital and the solvency of financial companies, we've, we've seen a very, very heavy response to the financial crisis, um, possibly more so than was uh, warranted. And it might just be that it will take a few years to unwind. So again, it's a question of deep pockets and patience if you really want to dominate that market. Sorry, could I just come back in on, on that particular point, which I think is an interesting one, drawing a parallel against the banking industry where you've had the same, I guess, regulatory response post the financial crash, and there's been a real direction of travel towards tightening information requirements and as well as the capital ratios that we've seen. But um, that's provided opportunities because the banks didn't have the ways of pulling together the various bits of data and analysing them real time that some of the entrepreneurs have been able to come into that space and deliver. I guess the difference with the insurance industry maybe is because it's all about you know the long-term data that the actuaries have their hands around already and there's no disruption to do. I, d I don't know, but th it's, I think regulations have, have been a friend to disruption of the banking industry, whereas they don't seem to have been the same in the uh, insurance space. Uh, I think it's a, a on this case, on this point, it's probably a point of perception. So. Um, Insurance, you can insure somebody without a computer if necessary. You can underwrite off the page. But uh, most insurance companies now in the last couple of years have had to go very heavily up the curve in terms of 
uh, technology, so capital models, calculations. Um, it's not universally spread, so what they haven't done is updated all of their IT and infrastructure. So there's lots of areas where insurance companies don't have cutting edge technology, but in certain areas this regulation has driven innovation. You've seen one or two software companies which have got innovative products benefit enormously, so something called Remetrica um, in the London market has done incredibly well, which is sort of a capital modeling platform. But that push from the regulation has changed people's mindset. So it kind of created a, an environment where there are new bits of kit. And when one department gets a new piece of technology and does something interesting for them, uh, you do get a discussion in other departments that maybe some of their software, which is 15 years old, is looking a little bit out of date. So regulation does, ri does raise the bar in what's acceptable. The challenges, though, is that in terms of innovation in finance, um, it's possible to do lightweight software in some areas, but quite often people just need it to work. The, the minimum viable product, if you follow lean, the MVP uh, in finance is just very heavy. Um, it's, it's got to stand up to scrutiny, and I think it's that which makes it a deep pockets industry. It's still entrepreneurial, but you have to have entrepreneurs with deep pockets. Okay, I'm going to have to close the panel there, given, given the time. Thank you very much, guys.